The other problem with having it at a casino is then the night before when we try to sit down and write a speech, <laughs> the wine is too plentiful <laughs> and too easy to access, and so we've kind of failed at that. You'll have to bear with me today. I'm not one that, that really likes to write speeches, and, and you know, Dr. Kahn referred to this earlier as a state of the system address, which sounds awfully formal. And that's just not the way that I like to approach it, because that's not what this is. It's really more of a, well, a chance to honor some examples of excellence around our system, and really a chance to say thank you to all of you in the room and the hundreds more that you represent at your campuses that are doing some really meaningful work. But we did have some formal remarks, and if you'll bear with me for just a minute. <clears throat> As we gather here today, <laughs> well, it starts with a bang, doesn't it? It is undeniable that we are living in an era of unprecedented change and innovation. The world is evolving at a rapid pace, and so too are the demands of the workforce. As we look towards the future of work, it is clear that higher education has an essential role to play. Universities have long been a cornerstone of our society, providing individuals with the skills, knowledge, and critical thinking abilities necessary to succeed in a variety of fields. But as we move into a new era of technological advancement, the importance of higher education cannot be overstated. The future of work will undoubtedly be shaped by emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotics. To succeed in this new landscape, individuals will need to be equipped with the skills necessary to leverage these technologies and adapt to new roles and responsibilities. Furthermore, the growing demand for a more diverse and inclusive workforce means that universities must also focus on cultivating an environment that is inclusive and supportive of all students, regardless of their background or identity. As we move forward towards a future that is increasingly shaped by technology, the role of universities in preparing students for success in the workforce will be more critical than ever. It is our responsibility to ensure that we are providing students with the tools, resources, and the support necessary to navigate this new landscape successfully. The future of higher education and its impact on the workforce is an open-ended discussion that requires collaboration, innovation, and continuous adaptation. We must continue to work together to ensure that our universities are providing the highest quality education possible, equipping students with the skills they need to succeed in a rapidly evolving world. That is what ChatGPT generated when Cammie put in a prompt that said, write a two-minute speech intro. <laughs> about the future of higher education and how important universities are to the future of work. And then, after the first response, she said, regenerate, remove the conclusion, and leave open-ended. When Caitlin saw that, her, in fact, I think her exact words were, Doc, you could add an obscure movie reference, a random poem, and a lame joke, and I would have thought you wrote that yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> Chat GPT. Guys, that's scary. It's got implications for us, ethical implications for us, pedagogical implications for us, but it's here. And we have to adapt, right? It's what we've done since the very beginnings of the academy is adapt to new changes. And certainly technology is providing challenges for us. <laughs> technology provides some real challenges for us in, a, in an acute way. Anybody from Hammond? <laughs> Southeastern? Yeah. Anybody from New Orleans? Yeah. It's a scary moment, isn't it? Let me give you a little bit of insight. In fact, I'm probably going to go beyond what I'm supposed to talk about on this, but I do think it's important that all of you understand a little bit about how this stuff works and how we're ahead of the game. Maybe only an hour ahead, but we're still ahead of nefarious actors. So the way that this works is three, four, even five years ago, a bad actor has gotten into one of our systems and implants a piece of malware. And Tom is here. Where is Tom? Right here. He said it's like the Manchurian candidate. 
some obscure movie reference. I asked if he was talking about the Denzel Washington men's, uh, <laughs> Manchurian Candidate or the real one, the Frank Sinatra one from back in the 60s. But it's like the Manchurian Candidate, they're just biding their time to try to collect information, to try to dismantle systems, to disrupt operations. And these things sit there, hidden, constantly trying to do their work, constantly trying to worm their way into different parts of our systems. And our systems are so connected now. Well, what happened in the case of Southeastern is we found it. We found it. It was such a novel piece of malware that with our experts at ESF-17, and this is going to shock some of you, Louisiana, the state of Louisiana, has one of the most sophisticated cybersecurity operations that exist anywhere on the planet. It's true. Now, that's little respite to those who are going through what they have to do at the time because it is so disruptive when they have to bring every aspect of a system down, systems that are connected like this through, and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna exhaust my technological repertoire pretty quickly, but through domain controllers, right? And they have to do it so quietly that the bad guys don't even know that they're doing it. And the bad guys can't know that we know. And in the case of Southeastern, where so many things were based on servers locally, it adds another complication to it. So they have to get the new domain controller up and then quickly bring it all down. And then you have to go into every aspect of it and try to clean it and try to find new ways to authenticate users and find new ways to restore services. And when it's a novel thing, you can't miss a beat because when you do, especially when you see this little thing called a million second timer, that tells you when that clock hits zero, there's another plan about to be launched. So for those of us who really like to communicate as I'm kind of doing now further than I'm supposed to, that puts us in a predicament because we can't talk about it. But because we have some resources in place, we were able to spend the next three weeks with the only other institution in our system that we knew of getting ready. And so when they took UNO's technological resources offline at 5 o'clock Friday, that was a planned event. And it was because of that preparation and the sacrifice of the people from Southeastern, and again, I apologize for that, UNO was back up with their student learning modules this morning. Went down Friday and back up this morning. Now, Guys, this is, it's, it's really scary stuff because these folks are out there operating every single day trying to find a way to get in. And remember, I told you, these were implanted three or four years ago. Right, it's scary stuff. Other institutions have gone through some similar things uh, and it's very disruptive, but that's what technology is presenting. Sorry about that, I've got to get my passport renewed so I can go to France next week and the, the passport agency trying to call me to tell me about it. Yeah, I get it. <clears throat> But one of the themes of this event is modernization and technology. And we're trying to find ways to not just be afraid of technology, but to embrace technology and utilize it to shape what we do, to utilize it to shape the way that we're producing students and graduates that are prepared for life and career success. And it is very challenging. Those acute challenges I talked about with cyber warfare, those are things that are irritants. The things that really scare me is that we're producing students for a world that we can't even really predict what it's going to look like. And we're seeing how technology is playing out already. I, I, I may have given you this statistic before, but from 2011 to 2019 in the Gulf of Mexico, we increased output by 40%, measured, I think, in barrels of oil. Over that same time period, Man hours worked in the Gulf of Mexico decreased by 40%. Output increased 40%, man hours decreased 40%. How many of you are comfortable telling a young man growing up in Vermilion Parish, Louisiana, that your future is going to be working in the oil field if you don't make it in college? No longer works. And this is not necessarily new. We saw this in the 70s. If you didn't succeed in school in New Orleans, you were going to have to go get a work get a job at Avondale. 
And then the folks at Avenel came to us and said, look, we can't hire ship fitters that don't have at least a basic understanding of calculus. So we've seen this technology and understanding and, 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 and uh, the manufacturing processes have gotten more complex that has demanded it. The problem now is it's expanding at an even more rapid pace and it's actually at an exponential rate. And that's the world that we live in. So technology is one we talk about a lot. It's a big challenge, but it gives us immense opportunities. But you all are pretty aware of some other challenges that we've got that aren't quite as fun as technology. Uh, anyone participate in the political sphere these days? Anyone pay attention to what happens in Florida? Or Texas? Or South Dakota? Or Iowa? Or anyone pay attention to what happened here last year in our legislative session? when we have a bill to create a task force to study tenure. That might be important to some of you. Uh, task force work has been phenomenal. Phil, thank you for your work in sitting by the phone. Yeah. Phil's been waiting for a meeting to be uh, scheduled since last August. It hadn't happened yet. So, Phil, just hang on. It's coming. It's coming. But, you know, the, the challenge with that is not it's, even that it's an argument over a real thing. Right? Tenure. Who could, if you want to say tenure is a job for life, for a faculty member to work 15 to 20 hours a week, indoctrinating students, spewing their leftist Marxist ideology and creating the new generation for the great new world order, that's a pretty, pretty insidious place to be. But if you also say that, hey, tell me another job anywhere in the world that has a six-year probationary period where you are measured by every aspect of your work by your peers and are determined, yes, we have determined after six years that you're worthy of being part of our faculty. And then you're subject to annual evaluation by your peers. When a, a legislator asked me, he says, well, how many people have gotten fired after they got tenure? I said, very few. But isn't that a testament to the quality of the program that awards tenure? And they kind of backed off a little bit, right? Where we run into problems is when we try to argue with the caricature. Because if I can create a caricature of an issue out here, and get people to have a bad idea about that or a bad feeling about that, it's so much easier. There was an old line that says, uh, wrestling with a pig, right? When you wrestle with a pig, you're both gonna get dirty and the pig enjoys it. <laughs> That's what arguing against a caricature is. That's why if we argue against a caricature, for example, of CRT, critical race theory, that's a great one that they put out there, right? If we can create it, it's Chris Rufo, who's working down in Florida these days, said our goal is to redefine that and to use it as an all-encompassing term so that if anybody sees anything crazy or wacky coming out of higher education, they're gonna associate it with CRT. See, we're not arguing about critical race theory, which is an academic concept that was traditionally done in law schools. We're arguing against what someone else has mischaracterized it. And that's a, that's a non-winnable fight. So it's not one that we're gonna engage in, but it's, it's one of our challenges. We've got internal challenges, too, as well. Uh, we saw on Gorg's presentation earlier today when we talked about the things that are affecting students. Uh, we saw this on, uh, in social media when we talk about people questioning the value of a college education. I will tell you today, I don't know if there's a more transformational experience than a college education because of the faculty that take a student under their wings, take an interest in mentoring them, developing them. I, my son, who's now in medical school in Shreveport, sent me a link uh, yesterday or earlier this week of his fourth paper that he's a co-author on with Dr. Harry Whitlow, who was from UL Lafayette, is being published in a peer-reviewed journal. That's extraordinary. That's extraordinary. And you could cite examples of that across faculty, across our system, but one in particular, and I just learned something new about him today. The, uh, I got to hire a, a faculty member when I was at Northwestern named Chris Lyles. 
And Chris came in, I think he had been at uh, University of Oklahoma or Oklahoma State, and he came in to be part of our faculty in the School of Biological and Physical Sciences. Chris is now the head of that department. But Chris got his master's degree under a person we're recognizing as our faculty member of the year. In fact, of this faculty member's 200 scholarly works, that, research works that have been uh, published, 33 of them were co-authored by undergraduates and over 40 of them co-authored by graduate students. That's incredible, life-changing work that he's doing. And so I hope that you all join me in welcoming a person that exemplifies not only teaching and learning, but research and scholarship, but service to students in a very meaningful way. It's our faculty member of the year, Raj Lupathi. Raj? The problem we recognize science-based uh, science faculty is I try to describe their work and it takes like two or three seconds for me to, to, to uh, show you that I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. But, uh, <laughs> but it, it asked me, ACLA is here, asked me, in fact, I told ASME that we were going to France next week and taking the Reginald F. Lewis scholars with us and I was talking about Versailles and how they're going to sit through some lectures about the, uh, the origins of democracy and how our republic was founded in 1789, at least that's when we, we, we uh, ratified the Constitution. Same year they had the French Revolution, and the French are on their fifth republic, and we're still on our first, arguably. And he says, you know, you may not know this, but it was scientists that were involved in the French Revolution. I said, tell me more. He says, no, he goes, actually the first three, the primary three that were captured and, and, and they were gonna be executed were a physicist and a mathematician and an engineer. And they asked the physicists, who were going to be the first executed with the guillotine, they said, now look, you can lay in this any way you want to. He says, well, I'm going to lay up and I'm going to look at the cosmos. I want my last conscious thought to be over the infinite space and how time and space are constantly expanding. I spent my life studying it and that's how I want to pass. They released the guillotine and it stopped right above his neck. And of course, it can only be divine intervention. And the crowd erupts in applause, and they said, well, listen, you're, you're free to go. It's, it's, a, it's a work of God. And so the mathematician was brought up to the guillotine. And he says, well, look, my life has always been about what's concrete. And I want to be executed face down, staring at the ground, because my work has always been grounded in logic and things that are real and tangible and finite. And he lays down into the guillotine, and they drop it, and it stops right above his neck again. A divine intervention and he gets up and he's able to walk away free man forever so the engineer comes up and says I don't know what these guys are talking about this stuff I just split the difference let me lay down sideways and he lays down sideways in the guillotine and they're just about to release and he goes hey wait a second I see what your problem is <laughs> right here <laughs> let chat GPT come up with that Caitlin <laughs> I apologize. So we've got some internal challenges too, and we saw a lot of that earlier today when we were looking at uh, talking about the state of students and how so many people initially put anxiety and mental health as issues, and we're seeing that play out across the board. I, I was uh, I, I serve on the board of Marine Corps University, and we had a meeting in Quantico, and one of my colleagues on that board is. Uh, um, the renewed couture who is the president of the university of houston system and monday she gets up and comes to me she says look i've got to step out we just had a student jump off of a building in, at the university of houston and she was the second time a student in just a matter of months has jumped off this building to commit suicide and it's just like i don't know the student and I don't even know the building, but it just, it just sucked all of the air out of the room because it brought back, even though we're having these great conversations about some work being done in Quantico, this constant unending story that we hear over and over again about a student needlessly 
taking a permanent solution to a temporary stress or temporary problem. And all of us are dealing with that across our campuses. Even if it's not so serious that someone might be committing suicide, we see it on the faces of most students. And it's an issue that we've got to struggle with, and we've got to figure out the answers to it, but we don't do it alone. And I'm so glad we have partners, and we have an MOU uh, with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And I know that they're here in the room. They just gave a session earlier today. Is there someone here from that organization? Hey, thank you. Thank you very much for your work. Thank you for helping us partner. As part of their MOU, they're providing training for, for students, faculty, staff, and students, and it is a, it is a problem that is uh, it's, it's really an epidemic. But thank you for being part of the solution. I, I really appreciate that. You know, resilience was another word we saw. Finances was another word we saw. And we have another partner here, the Baton Rouge Youth Coalition. That's a group that is, that, thank you, man. Thank you for being here, both of you. Thank you for asking questions of Doric earlier. Really pressing questions. Actually, before I couldn't write a speech, I was so captivated and contemplating the answers to, to your questions. I still didn't come up with any solutions. But, but what they do is they help under-resourced students be resilient. They stay with them throughout their college journey. They've got an MOU with us as well. And they're coaching those students to success. And these are high-performing students that have every reason in the world not to be successful, but because of partners like BRYC, BRIC, as we uh, collegially pronounce it, is, uh, is making a difference. And it took me back to something that I saw firsthand when I really wasn't that sure of the stresses that students were under. I hadn't experienced it myself. And it was back when we did registration in person. You know, on registration day, does everybody remember that? Some of them still do it. And they, uh, I'm standing in the lobby of a student service building and a groundskeeper comes in and he says, hey, uh, I think y'all need to know there's a lady out in her car in the parking lot crying. And I don't, I don't do criers well, we all have our limitations, but the person next to me, uh, the Vice Chancellor of Student Services named Karen Reckia, did do criers well. And so she says, I'll handle it. And she goes outside. And she came back in about 20 minutes later with this young woman, maybe late 20s. And she says, uh, Chancellor, I was a chancellor at the time, she goes, this is Misty, and Misty's gonna enroll in school today. I thought, well, that's great, Misty. It's very nice to meet you. The tears had dried up. I was a little more comfortable. I ran into her uh, a couple months later. Uh, it was a rainy day. She was coming down the stairs. I was coming in the building. She was wearing some galoshes. I said, Misty, man, I, I love your boots. Those are really cool. And she says, thanks. I found them on the side of the road. And then I took the family to a Friday night dinner at uh, Carrabba's. And we were kind of sitting over in a torn corner table. And I had a seat in the back. And it was dark. And my youngest son was very young, and he wanted spaghetti and meatballs. Well, a server who was not our waitress came up and delivered us some spaghetti and meatballs and started singing to him. On top of spaghetti, all covered with cheese, grated some cheese on his thing. He was elated. And I kind of squinted a little bit, and I looked. It was Misty, the same girl that I had seen at school. So when we went back to the restaurant, Maybe a year later, I asked to be seated at Misty's table, and they said, well, Misty doesn't work here anymore. And I said, oh, God, what happened? They said, nothing. She completed a credential, and she got a job working at one of the automotive dealerships. She actually schedules all the service and all the maintenance on all the cars that come through. She's got health insurance, and she and her child finally got their own place to live. You see, when Misty had come into that parking lot in her car, it took the last bit of courage to pull into the parking lot. And she couldn't muster enough courage to get out of the car and come in and register for school. That car was her safe space because that car is where she and her child slept most of the nights of the week. But because a staff member, a groundskeeper, saw a student that needed help, he didn't know how to provide it, but he knew how to go find the answer that one moment of truth, that one intervention, changed the life of this young woman and her child. It was that same, that same day, end of the day, I remember getting ready to walk out of the building and this young woman comes walking in very quickly, wearing scrubs, with a baby on her hip, 
and the weight of the world on her shoulders. And she looked at me, she says, please don't tell me I'm too late. I said, ma'am, I wouldn't tell you that, I wouldn't tell you that if you were, because I was very intimidated at this moment. <laughs> we take her in, get her through the registration process. The first thing she needs to do though, is she's got to figure out her financial aid. We had financial aid set up in kind of a, 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 a place where multiple students could come flying through. You could do them quick pace, right, R real quick. And I'm walking around, and I'm standing behind the financial aid counselor, Adriana Poland. I still remember Adriana. This young woman comes up, Adriana's punching in her information, and I'm not sure what was on the screen, but I could tell there was a problem. And I knew one more straw would be enough. But Adriana just kind of looked at the screen for a minute. She, she took a deep breath. She goes, listen, I want you to know something. She goes, you're going to be fine. You're going to be eligible for financial aid. There is a little challenge, but we're going to help you fix it. All of a sudden, the weight of the world just slipped off this woman's shoulders. And all of a sudden, she kind of stood up. She said, oh, God, thank you. Thank you. I can now go back to school. Two stories of staff people. They could have done things differently. One, doing something completely out of his job, just taking an interest. An other one, doing her job in a way that was, showed empathy to a student that was in distress, and she had to intervene. And she did it with grace and style. And I walked away thinking, we need 100 more groundskeepers and 100 more Adriana Polans to, to deal with this. And that's what staff does. That's what every one of us does when we interact with a student and we take ownership of that student's moment. Which brings me to our staff member of the year. And how appropriate is it today that it's a librarian? I know of no group of people, and I'm painting with a very broad brush, of steely-eyed advocates for learning than librarians. And this librarian works at, at Louisiana Tech, but she carries her service to Lincoln Parish. She does it in public service, volunteer efforts. Yeah, oh, we let the cat out of the bag. She, uh, uh, she is a remarkably gifted person who is leading the transformation of public libraries and academic libraries. I hope you all join me in welcoming our staff member of the year, Sandra Dupree. Sandra. <laughs> make you walk all the way across the stage because they've got little footprints for me to stand on and I've, it's the puppet masters over here. Please come on this side. Just thank you for your work. It's a beautiful cross, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> you know, my mother was a, my mother was a librarian and, and I lost her before Christmas, but I uh, Oh, more pictures. Yeah. I was telling her about my mother. I lost my mother right before Christmas, and uh, my mother had gotten her EDD at the University of Arkansas when I was really young, and then decided to go back and get another degree in uh, 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 Master's in Library and Information Science. And she had three young sons at home, and we used to always kid her, Mom, who needs a master's degree to calculate fines and stamp books? <laughs> yeah, that was a really smart thing to say. <laughs> so she made us all read her thesis and do a report on it. I'll never say a negative word about a librarian again. They're, they're angels. Uh, another, you know, I talked about tenure and the way tenure has been, in, in, has been uh, caricatured. Another thing that's been caricatured a lot, because it, it, some people just think it's an easy target and some people just really aren't very good people. But it's in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we've done a lot of work in diversity, equity, and inclusion in our system. In fact, we're unabashed about our efforts in that sphere. I think we're the first system in Louisiana to have a diversity, equity, and inclusion lead on, at all nine of our institutions. 
Uh, that work is great. Of course, that work is spearheaded at the state level by Claire Norris, uh, then inimitable Dr. Claire Norris, who came to us as a data person, and now she's our Vice President of Advancement, Data, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and is it all? <laughs> That's all. It's a lot of work. Uh, she's the one that has led our Reginald F. Lewis Educational Equity Initiative, I saw, which is a very broad, sweeping uh, effort to improve the lives of students from underrepresented populations, socioeconomic, demographic, whatever they are, to ensure that we're providing inclusive environments for all of them. She was, I, know, I saw Gabe Willis come in earlier, and I think Ked Nicholas was here. They came to her with an idea for a, a, a pre-conference session for black males, and she turned it into the annual Black Male Summit. Uh, the next one's coming up in June, June 21st and 2nd in New Orleans. Uh, so I hope you can attend that. She's the one that has led us uh, to developing the Reginald Lewis Scholars Program. And those first 18 members of that scholarship program will be going with us to France next week. And uh, where's Jerry? Yeah. There he is. How exciting is it that we're seeing labor unrest playing out in France at the time we're going to bring 18 scholars from Louisiana? <laughs> How cool is that? Huh? I think, it's, I think it's extraordinary. The, the whole purpose of study abroad is developing cultural competence, and that means understanding differences in people. And you understand why the French historically believed that life begins when you retire at 62. <laughs> you know, it's just a different culture. For us, we have people that want to continue. I mean, Joe is 87 and is still. <laughs> I apologize. Stick to the script, Jim. Stick to the script. <laughs> but that work of DEI sometimes can get encapsulated in very narrow definitions. I tell you, it's very broad. You know, DEI is an integral part of the work of all nine of our institutions, including, and this is what shocks some people that take a narrow view of it, Grandma State University. Why would Grambling State need to be, it's an HBCU, why do they focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion? Well, because it's the place where everybody is somebody. Huh? And so, when Rick Gallo made this nomination for a, a person to win the, fact, the, the diversity champion, diversity uh, award winner for our system, I wasn't surprised who she is. She is the uh, first female director of the greatest band on the planet Earth. Her contributions to diversity, equity, and inclusion include the following, a minority-focused mentoring and coaching, combating underrepresentation through excellence in her work, fostering equity and inclusion across campus, department, and student leadership teams, advancing national conversations on the need for women and minorities in leadership, through her growing state and national platforms. I always think of her as the person that I get to hug on the first Saturday after Thanksgiving every year in front of 70,000 people <laughs> when she marches in with the world famed. So please join me in, in recognizing and congratulating Dr. Nicole Robo. If y'all have not witnessed the Bayou Classic in person, let alone standing on the field, I'm telling you, it is a spectacle that Louisiana should embrace and be proud of because there's nothing like it. Southern brings in a, a, like an intramural group that they call a band. <laughs> That's not true. They, they're excellent. They're excellent. Okay, well, thank you so much for everything. You bet. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. She's an amazing leader in an institution that has produced some of the greatest. Uh, uh, first time I was in Hutch Hutchinson Hall, 
uh, is when I came to terms with just the legacy of Grambling. So, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson Jones was president at Grambling for 51 years. Thank you. He just happens to make two hiring decisions amongst many. One, he hires Eddie Robinson to be a football coach. Some of you might have heard of Eddie Robinson. Uh, by the way, Grambling does not exist in the mountains like Gorg's. Uh, <laughs> for, for those in South Louisiana, I think that's what it looks like, but no, it's a, he hired Eddie Robinson, and then he hired Hutch Hutchinson. And Hutch comes in and says, all right, I'll do it if we can create the greatest band in the world. Now they had ordered, I think, 18 instruments from the Sears and Roebuck catalog. And 10 or 15 years later, they're marching at halftime at the NFC Championship game. And they traveled to Africa, and they traveled to Asia, and they traveled to Europe, and they became the most iconic marching band in the world. What, what happens, what, what mix of things has to happen for a world-renowned educator, the greatest football coach that ever lived, and a band director of that type of vision and gumption to come together. It's an institution called Grandma. And so, Rick, thank you for your work in leading an institution and bringing it to, to that level. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of bring this somewhat to wrapping up a little bit. As we start talking about the challenges, it's really also understanding our work. And, and you know about some of the systemic work that we're doing that we hope is, is, is supporting and augmenting and enhancing the work that's going on on all nine of our institutions. You know, system is kind of a different animal. We've got nine distinct institutions, each with its own role, scope, and mission, each with its own level of excellence, each finds a different way to distinguish itself from the others. Uh, you know, we now have an R1 research institution at UL Lafayette. That's kind of important. We now have a doctor of physical therapy in our system at ULM. And we could go around the horn and talk about these, these, these pockets of excellence, and then we try to leverage them systemically to do meaningful work for the state of Louisiana. And, and, and one of the ways we do that is with these interventions, like the Reginald F. Lewis Scholars Program, like Compete LA, and I'm wearing the button here. You know, keep, Compete LA is our effort to knock down barriers that prevent working adults from returning to school so they can finish what they started. We have 653,000 Louisianans with some college and no degree. As such, they're basically shut out from realizing their full potential. So we created this intervention, and it's one that I'm, 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 I'm proud of. It's one that we have to bring to scale. I think it's one that's going to pay great dividends, not for us, but for those that we serve. And another systemic intervention, if you will, is our core competency work. And that's one of the threads of this conference. I don't know how many of you, <laughs> I don't want to do a survey. Gork puts me on the spot with that. But how many of you have heard of the core competency work? Oh, good. The last time I asked that, like three hands went up. And, and, and that was asking of the committee that actually did the work. So, <laughs> uh, but Kim Long from University of New Orleans helped lead this work with presidents and faculty throughout to come up with a way to define what it means to be a graduate of one of our institutions. And this work is important for a lot of reasons. When you hear people questioning the value of a college degree, it's because they don't know what a college degree is. Even those that have graduated from school. There's one guy on one particular cable news channel that has a show every night that has a liberal arts degree from a liberal arts college. And he leads the show almost every night bashing colleges and universities because they're not necessary. We've done a really poor job of articulating the value of our work. I've done a poor job in my career. When in workforce development, man, I'm telling you, we want to get you to a short-term credential so we can get you into a job, we can fill the needs of an employer, you can make a livable wage, and we're done. And that's important. It's important that we are an avenue to employment and higher wages for those that we graduate. But that can't be the whole of what we do because we're not just preparing people to get a job and be successful, we're preparing people ostensibly, we say it anyway, for life 
and career success. And life success, if you're like the French, life begins at retirement. So that life success means that you're fulfilling your own potential as a thinker, as a learner, as a citizen that's contributing to community. All of that is inherent in the work that we do. And so these core competencies are aimed to help articulate that in a way that's digestible and can be brought away and people can understand that yes, there is value to this work. And those core competencies aren't brand new. In fact, they've been, a lot of them have been the root of the academy since its very beginnings. We're, when we study at Sorbonne next week with the scholars, this is an institution that opened in the middle of the 13th century. And it started with people that used to gather on the banks of the Seine River and listen to philosophers talk just so that they could learn more about life, this condition of life. So these core competencies, creative and, and critical problem solving, communications, cultural competence. We're preparing students to work with teams that come from different backgrounds, different belief systems, different experiences. And how do you prepare someone to do that? And it's not about having them question their own thinking or to try to brainwash them or, or, or into another way of thinking, indoctrinate them in another way of thinking. No, it's just helping them ask the question, why? And your truth is fine. And you can work with someone who's working with a completely different truth. One of my best colleagues, one of my best friends, the one that I will call sometimes for advice on certain things, is a Wiccan priestess who teaches feminist studies. Now, when I was a student in the early, late 80s, early 90s, uh, I would not have been a very good feminist studies student. I know that's a shock for the women in the room <laughs> to think that a white, gray-haired man is not conversant in feminist theory. But I sat through her lectures five years ago and became much more enlightened. And I watched as she engaged every student in that room, met them where they were, and walked them to a better place of understanding. Phenomenal, phenomenal scholar. But I'm a striving to be devout Catholic white male. There's all kinds of reasons for she and I to disagree. But because we're culturally competent and we respect each other, we, 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 we find that value that brings us together. And it's so much more powerful. In fact, we're better because we are different. We're better because we are different. Cultural competence is one of the keys that we've got to develop in young people that are coming out if we're going to be successful as a state and as a country, right? Another piece, resilience. And resilience is not just, you remember from the, the Rocky Balboa movie? It's not how hard you can hit, it's how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. That's part of resilience. But another aspect of resilience is knowing where there's help, right? How many students we saw this come up with faculty saying, we wish students know that they could come to faculty for help. And I wish sometimes faculty knew that they could come to other faculty or to administration or to system for help. We don't do enough time talking about that, but that's gotta be an aspect of resilience. And the last of the core competencies, the one that is, is anyone that opens your Facebook feed and you see this list of stories that you agree with that affirm what you want to be, believe to be true, it's self-reflective awareness. That ability to reflect on the things that you don't know the things that you know to be true that aren't, to help you come to terms with your own cognitive limitations, the fact that you need to read things from multiple sources, that you have to expand your horizons, that a very, very narrow view of the world is likely going to be very wrong. And teaching our students to look at sources and look at the value of those sources and to, to ensure that they're not just watching Fox News at night, but they're watching CNN, that they're not just reading, as I did as an undergrad, National Review, but you also read Slate. It's about getting sources of information from multiple places, being able to evaluate it, and really come to a new realization of what truth is. That's self-reflective awareness. We're going to talk a lot more about that tomorrow on a panel, and I hope that you'll engage uh, in this core competency work on your campus, because I think it's really going to be important. I think it's going to really be important. I am so bullish on the future of higher education. We're in a place not right now in Louisiana, legislatively, better than we've been in a long, long time. Last year was probably our most successful legislative session since we became a system in 1974, when you look at the investments of capital. But we're still a heavily under-resourced enterprise. 
You see that when you look at your paycheck, right? And we've had under our governor some infusions of resources to try to change that, but we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. The decade that came from 2009 to, to 2016 was hard on a lot of us. And we started to right the ship. But you don't heal from that overnight. And so we're going to continue advocating strongly for resources to, to come to our schools and to come to those that are doing this work that is so important for the future of our state and for the future of our people. Because it matters for people like Robert. Robert is uh, from Sulphur, Louisiana. He was a welder for the state, worked, I guess, for DOTD. And when he got his paycheck, he looked at his paycheck and it says, do you want to finish your degree? Go to competela.org. Robert was paired with a coach. He got his associate degree last December. He's gonna graduate in May from McNeese State University. He's not leaving this organization, yeah, thank you. In his words, he doesn't want to leave his organization. He just wants to do something that adds more value to that organization. And his college degree prepares him to do it. I wish we could just put him on a billboard and just tell his story to everybody so they could understand the power of your work. It's important. It's important. We're here on the campus of McNeese. <laughs> kind of. Work with me on that. It's not quite the campus of McNeese. But we're at an institution that has been through two of the most powerful storms that have ever hit the United States. When Daryl Burkell called me in the middle of the night and said, well, we're moving to another building because the roof was blown off of this one. I said, good Lord, man, just be safe. And then six weeks later, all the blue tarps were blown off of those buildings and nature dropped 14 inches of water into every one of those buildings. And then in Lake Charles, they were hit with a winter storm. In Lake Charles, they were hit with a winter storm, a freaking blizzard in southwest Louisiana. Are you kidding me? And then a biblical flood. How is McNeese still open, Daryl? It starts with leadership, but it starts with a family of educators that is devoted to the concept of learning. I'll never forget the look on the face of a woman at this warehouse they had that was coming to pick up toiletries and supplies to go back home. And I said, Madam, it's, it's so good to see you. Uh, I, I, I'm praying for you, thinking of you, all these things. And she goes, well, Dr. Henderson, you know me. She was a nurse faculty member at McNeese. It touched every person here. We saw it down the bayou at Nichols and on the shore of Lake Pontchartrain at UNO and up in the North Shore at Southeastern when Ida came through. We've gone through a lot. And you put all of that in the context of a three-year pandemic after a decade of budget cuts, there's a lot to be, well, to feel bad about. But when you start seeing the faces of these students that are walking across the stage and see them empowered to take control of their lives, Man, that's worthwhile. That's worthwhile. And it's because of you. I'm so honored to be able to do this work with you. I love that every year we get to gather and, and with colleagues and commune and have a little fun. Uh, tonight, uh, I don't know anything about this poker game, but if anyone wants to try to learn poker with me, I can set up a table. Um, <laughs> it's no limit hold'em. Uh, $100 buy-in, $1, $2 binds. I don't know anything about it, but I'd love to play with someone who wants to teach. <laughs> we'll set that up. I hope that you get to enjoy a little bit of R&R &R while you're here. And, 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 and just want to say thank you. Thank you for the work that you do every day on behalf of our, our state, on behalf of our system, but more importantly, on behalf of our students. You're doing God's work, and it's important. So hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. I look forward to seeing you and engaging in some conversations. Uh, but thank you. Have a great day. See you.